Ollie, thank you for agreeing to talk to me, mate. How are you? Yeah, really good, really good. It's, I'm, I'm glad we finally made it to this point, mate, because I know we've sort of bounced on a few dates and uh, we're actually yeah. here at the, at the rendezvous. If not in the flesh, at least visually. Um, I tell you what, it's not every day I start an interview by asking about a 50 kilogram chimpanzee, but uh, oh, straight in there. I mean, straight in there, mate. You have to ask that question because I mean, it, it's not an everyday occurrence when you're 10 years old to bump into the mother of a baby chimpanzee who basically potentially wants to end your life. No, absolutely. But I am really glad that you did start there, um, Ross, because a lot of people sort of that really is the, was the starting point of my life. Because I don't remember a lot before 10 years old because of that traumatic experience. And it was a very defining point of my life as well. So, yeah, I was in, I was brought up in a place called Burton on Trent, Staffordshire, Brewery Town, and um, boiling hot day. And uh, mate came round, asked if we want to go to the swimming baths. Um, absolutely perfect day for it. So we, off we went. Mum chucked us out of the house, glad to get some space. And, um, and there we saw something across the other side of the bridge, which was amazing. That was the, that was the, uh, the big top had set up in town. And uh, our walk turned into a run before we knew it. We were at the uh, circus there. Went to the first bloke that we saw. This was 1980, so there's no, no health and safety, pretty much non-existent. And uh, we just said, look, can we have a look around? And he was like, yeah, lads, help yourself. All the, you know, the animals are out, but they're on chains and blah, 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 blah. So we went in there, standard kind of circus kit, you know, elephants, this, that, and the other, and nothing really that exciting. And I was drawn to this other side of the, the marquee where there was a split. And um, for some reason, I separated away from the other two. And I pulled back this curtain, sun hit me straight in the eyes. And for a second, I was, I was, you know, sort of blinded by the glare. And then all of a sudden that cleared. And what, what was sat in front of me was absolutely amazing because I was brought up with Tarzan, you know, the old black and white Tarzan. Same here. Used to, yeah, loved it, loved it. So what sat in front of me was like a little piece of Hollywood. There was Cheetah sat there in this open expanse. And I was like, whoa, this is amazing. I, I, walked, off, I walked over to it. And before I knew it, I was looking down on this creature. I wasn't much bigger than, than the chimp, you know, to be honest. Looked a lot like it, obviously. But, uh, uh, and uh, this chimp looked up, beautiful big brown eyes. And um, it was an amazing moment. It was like this baby David Attenborough meets chimp. And uh, it was an amazing moment, amazing moment. And then it started picking food off the floor and it was handed it to me. And I was thinking, I'm not gonna have that, it's disgusting. But I didn't want to break that moment. So I was like taking it and pretending to, to to eat it, but thrown it over my shoulder. And it was probably a couple of seconds, but it felt like a lifetime. And uh, such a peaceful moment, but that serenity was broken like a fighter jet cutting through the sky as I heard this massive roar. And I can still hear that roar to this day, actually. And um, in the shadows in the background, it was an open area, but it was enclosed. And under a trailer, there was something moving and screaming, shouting, roaring. And um, that very quickly turned into the shadows, very quickly turned into what was clearly mummy and dad, mummy or daddy, around about 50 kilograms. Believe me, I didn't get a chance to weigh it, but it was big. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, it started making its way to me at Mac 10, you know, the old sideways chimp thing, you know, at screeching, going mental. And I'm stood there thinking, Gee, deer in the headlights kind of scenario, thinking, what do I do? And at the moment, I thought, I need to get out of here. This thing jumped through the air. It seemed like 20 feet through the air. The blue sky turned to black as this thing landed on my chest, pinned me to the floor, and was just going at me like a drummer in a rock band, just smashing down on my, on my chest. The first fist just blew everything out, all the air out of me, winded me totally, and then just a barrage of fists coming down. And then it started trying to attack me, trying to bite me. And uh, I was just in self-protection mode. I was absolutely in state of shock, self-protection kind of mode. But in that moment, it was fight or flight. And if I didn't take the action I took in that moment, then I wouldn't be here today. And that was simply, you know, I, I, I managed to take, find the courage to actually take the fight to the chimp. And at 10 years old, that's quite, 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 a, uh, quite an act. Uh, but uh, I managed to get the chimp off. Or, or managed to dislodge the chimp slightly, got my knee up to my chest, managed to plant my foot in the chimp's chest, knock it off totally, gave me a few seconds to get out of there. And then I was there on the ground and the chimp got to its feet. It was coming on its final attack for me. And just as it got to me, it was like a hair's width away from me. 
Um, it was caught by a chain. Um, and uh, I stood to my feet. I was covered in blood. I was absolutely traumatized. The whole place erupted. It bit you, and, didn't it, as uh, well? I mean, it didn't just pop Yeah, you know, it tore my arm to bits. You know, massive chunks out of this arm. Well, I'm, I'm, at, at 10 years old, it was a big chunk out of this arm. Uh, there was bites all over me, blood, blood, blood all over the place. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, the story goes on and on and on, um, which is obviously featured in, in my books. But, um, you know, I nearly lost my arm to gangrene. I really, for me, and the reason I talk about that event so much is for a couple of reasons. That firstly is, you know, people underestimate the kind of uh, childhood trauma um, that really does affect us in our later life, uh, which was very apparent for me. But for me also, that was my first break point. Now, break point for me is when you decide to step into the short-term discomfort for long-term gain. Now, the short-term discomfort for me was taking the fight to the chimp that day. Obviously, the long-term gain was the fact that I lived, uh, you know, and, and, and that happened that day. And really, that was the creation. I mean, I'm sat here now, 40 years, 49 years, no, 39 years later. Sorry, I'm not that yeah, old yeah. yet. You're not that old. Um, in, uh, in the Breakpoint Academy, you know, so I, I sometimes look at this and think, bloody hell, that chimp's got a lot to answer for. You said once, mate, just as you said, you said, um, there are some people who spend their lives underneath the chimp and there are some people yeah. who decide to fight it off. All right? Exactly, mate. And that's that analogy. You know, at the end of the day, we are, the way we're wired, we're wired to, to avoid stress, discomfort, and we're always taking the, the, the road of least resistance. And that, if you, have, if you sort of adopt that process throughout your life, you'll end up with a pretty uneventful, pretty boring depressing lifestyle uh, but that's just the way that we're wired you know a lot of people would have just sat there taken the beating and and um possibly you know if that had happened to me i would i wouldn't be here um but really anything in life you want to change you want to achieve it's not about going don't i'm not suggesting anyone goes to the circus and finds the, the nearest chimp but all i am saying is that you know you need to, to to achieve anything in life whether that's relationships addictions alcohol abuse, you know, alcohol abuse, whatever it is, that takes a level of short-term discomfort for the long-term gain. And that is really the analogy and ethos behind Breakpoint. Um, Breakpoint is just one of the many initiatives that you've been involved in through your life. I'll tell you one thing that, you know, I, I, um, I was reading, obviously, I read your notes, and I was looking at one thing you said. Um, I think this was to do when you were going through selection to get into the SBS. You had a, a serious ankle injury or leg injury. Mm, yeah. And you yeah. said... You said, if anybody is, is doubting your dream, they're pissing on your bonfire. And I've had that all the way through my career. I felt like, going, God, that's very similar to the way I feel about my career. <laughs> but I mean, you know, having people doubt you, you talk about that as well. And that may be also something to do. Yeah. You're very, very into, into spiritualism now and, and, and bringing it back to yourself and making yourself a better person. But do you really honestly feel that? Despite, I mean, you had an amazing career in the military and subsequently an amazing career on the circuit. And then obviously you went into rescuing kids in, in Thailand, etc. cetera. You, you know, you've never sat still. You've always moved on and moved upwards as you still are. Um, do, you think, do you think people are still pissing on your bonfire? No, I don't think so anymore. But I just think that, um, you know... I think it's just the way, I, th I think everyone gets that doubt. There's a lot of people that get that doubt. And I think there's probably some people on the, in this world that just doesn't really listen to it when people doubt them. You get some kind of people, some people that do listen to it. You get some people that they listen to and it stops them in their tracks from ever achieving anything. But you get some people, and it's certainly the way I looked at it, whenever anyone said to me, you can't do it, it was almost like a red flag to a ball. I was like, well, I'm going to prove it. Even if it didn't really you know, create a passion within me. Sometimes I just do it just to prove someone wrong. Um, but, you know, that has always been the case for me. You know, it was a case that, you know, when someone said, oh, you can't, pass, you won't. No, 14 years old, I stood up in my maths uh, lesson and said, I don't really care about this. I'm going to join the Royal Marines. And the teacher said, you know, you haven't got the discipline to join the Marines or the military. And that was really the catalyst that, that really inspired me to, to go and do it. So I really thank my maths teacher for, for, for saying that and it's kind of that kind of then went into everything I did you know like the when I went from the marines into the special forces you know the the person that was in charge of me at the time 
he laughed at me when I said I was going to go on selection. Um, and he said, I can't wait to see you back here in a couple of weeks because um, when you fail, and I never saw him again. How many guys passed? Five out of 200 odd? Is that right? Yeah, 250, around about 250. There was five. I actually did two selections. That second selection is when I bust my ankle up. Uh, but the first selection is when uh, I had a bit of an altercation with a Welsh farmer. Yeah, I went for selection twice. And the first time, um, I got all the way to the end. It's a six month process, as you, as you know. Um, and uh, the, the last bit is, is escape innovation across the Welsh hills. They do it in Scotland or Wales. And uh, three rules, no, no civilian contact, no vehicles, and no uh, buildings. You're not allowed to enter any of them. Uh, but everyone does. It's a case of uh, getting the job done. Getting the job done without getting caught. Exactly. exactly. And, that, and that really, when you look at it, that's, that's, when you look at the special forces and the, the, what, the reason they have been so, so successful in their missions and, and the reason they get things done is because when they're told to do something, they don't have to seek a higher command to get authority to take the shot, for instance. They do whatever they need to get the job done. And really, you know, that is sort of the ethos on that course as well. Just don't get caught. Um, but anyway, I had a Welsh farmer that, that was extremely drunk who gave us a lift, fell out of his car, smashed his head open, and then went to the hospital and said he'd been beaten up by the SAS. <laughs> so, uh, mate, my dream came to a, uh, to, a, to a massive halt, two days to being badged. Oh, mate, after how long? Just explain how much pain and yeah, how many pain. months. Well, I mean, you've got six months of the course, but then you've got the two, three, four months of training before that. And then to, to, that was a low point, a low point. But you've had those. You've had low points. And, you, and, you, and you're one of those few that have been in SF and that, that talk openly about them. And I think that's also something to be admired and also says something about you as a person, just how strong you are. I mean... You, you, when you were a young Marine, a young bootneck, you, you went out to Northern Ireland. And I think there was an incident very early on where you realised that it wasn't, it wasn't a game anymore, right? Yeah, I mean, for me, yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, that was, that was interesting because it's like you, you do your training. Uh, you know, you join because you see you've, you've got this glossy brochure. And in the glossy brochure, you see someone in their full dress uniform. And you think, oh, all the girls will be gagging for that. Then on the next few pages, you see some bloke who's on leave and he's in the Bahamas on a windsurf and his blonde, beautiful girlfriend's on the beach. And um, when I finished Or he's skiing training, down a mountain with a pint in his hand. That's it, yeah. <laughs> and when I joined, there was none of that. <laughs> yeah. So really, I mean, you know, my first tour out in Northern Ireland, but really that was a, an eye-opener because that was my first, you know, they call, they call it a conflict, but the way I see it, if someone's trying to kill you, I call that a war. Um, and um, it was, you know, a time where I grew up very quickly when I realized it was no longer a game and, and war was, was extremely real. You know, when you stood there, there's, there's um, you know, in the middle of a uh, bomb site where, there, you know, there's been a massive explosion, people are dead. You, you realize very quickly that it's no longer a game and you need to up your game and grow up. So that was 18 and that was a bit of, well, I was, not, I was 19 by that time. Yeah, so, but yeah, that's effectively, effectively 19 is, is young, right? Oh, the thing is, at the time, you think, you, you think you, you're, you're a man, but you're so young. I mean, I look at my son, he's 19. I just, I can't, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't comprehend that I was that age. Um, do you think if you hadn't, you know, growing up in Burton, you say it was a brewery town, you, you experienced alcohol at an early age. Do you think, you know, have had been for that mass teacher that you may have ended up in prison? No, I don't believe so, mate. I think uh, at that time, I mean, it was after sort of the chimp attack. My life went on turbo. It was, it was like mayhem on steroids. And um, I was just chasing danger. And um, Shotgun. I'm just going to say shotgun to you. Shotgun. Yeah. yeah, mate. Well, that was an experience. But the thing is, I tell you, I know it sounds weird. But, and, and we acquired a shotgun from someone's house. I took it home at 14 years old. And uh, whacked it in the vice in the garage and, and, and made it. It was, it, was, it, was, it was a bit too big, mate. It just didn't, oh, you know. yeah. Particularly when you're 14. You don't want the too big shotgun, do you? you want to no, it, well, it was bigger than me. <laughs> <laughs> so I whacked it in the vice and chopped off the barrel. And it was a lot more convenient then. You just wandered around Burton on Trent with a sawn off. Yeah. Well, I just, Rambo had just come out. And, uh, oh, right. You know, I think, that, I think I've got, he's a lot to blame as well as the chimp. So, uh, so Rambo would come out, you know, I had a big There's a lot Rambo. of influences. There's a lot of TV influences in your life. I'll tell you what though, mate, I'll tell you what, I got, 
the year I got attacked by the chimp was the Iranian embassy as well. Oh, right. Yeah, so that was a massive, and I was like watching that like a, I was like thinking, oh my God, this is amazing. And that was, that was, the, that was when the seed was sown, I think. That was a catalyst, you think, part of the catalyst. And it was for many, wasn't it? I have to say, I think that yeah. was the first time that we, we became aware that, that, that special forces were out there. And also it was something that we as a, as a fighting nation uh, mm. excelled in. And, yeah. um, and, and, and we still do, thank God. Um, mate, you know, what actually made you decide, because, it, because someone said you couldn't do it again, was that right about joining, joining the SPS? No, I I, mate, I tell you what, it was like going back to the chimp again, but you know, that gave me un, an un, unhealthy appetite for chaos and war seemed like the perfect fit for me at that stage. Um, and then I got into the Royal Marines, went to Northern Ireland, went to uh, Iraq on Operation Desert Storm, I have to tell you, I came back from there and I was so disillusioned. I was so deflated, if you want to call it that. Well, because of the lack of contact or what? Yeah, well, no, I mean, I've I've got some decent stuff, but I expect, yeah, you're probably right. I expected a lot more. I expected a lot more. And I I had this unhealthy appetite for war, wanted to be at war every day. And this looking back, mate, this is why I keep saying this. You know, I I I bounced from one thing to the next to the next. You know, I then went to the Special Forces because this, what, the Royal Marines wasn't enough. Um, and also someone telling me I couldn't do it. Um, and also, uh, and then when I got there, though, I was like, past selection, I was like, is this it? And again, you know, this was at the time when there wasn't the, the Afghanistan, the, the Iraq wars. There was the odd jobs going off here and then, but it just wasn't enough for me. But I thought that the answer to all my um, confusion and my frustration would be going to war. I didn't realize until years later that there was a war with inside me that was the problem, not the external uh, factors that were the, that were the, uh, where the gaps were. And it was really, when I look back now, I actually understand that, um, you know, I was, I was looking for this external fix and the only thing that needed fixing was me. Um, and it wasn't until, you know, a long time later that I actually realized that. Well, I'd like to talk about that because I'm fascinated about the fact that, you know, you saw psychological, spiritual help and you, you talk about visualization, but just in terms of your life. So you're in the SBS elite special force, uh, known around the world. I think you did refer at some point to, you know, jumping out of submarines, you have to do night jumps, uh, into the sea, etc. I mean, this is highly specialized stuff. Um, James Bond stuff, but that still wasn't enough for you. No, and that was the frustrating thing, you know, because when I look at it now, I look back now, and, and when I looked forward to actually being able, you know, thinking that I could achieve that, it was like this amazing dream. Even when I look back now, I think, Jesus, I got paid for doing that. Um, and it's something now that I'd love to do. You can't, you know, you can't even pay for it if you wanted to. Um, but at the time, in the moment, when I was living in the now, it, there's, there's something wasn't connecting, something wasn't right, I wasn't settled, I wasn't fulfilled. And I just, that whole frustration about achieving something that was absolutely amazing and people would give their right arm to be where I was and, and, and trying to understand why I wasn't feeling this sense of ful- fulfillment was really knocking me backwards, knock, really knocking me around. Again, about the internal versus the external, yeah? Yeah, yeah. It was almost like the perception did not, you know, reality and perception are never the same anyway, but it was so far between the two that it was just, it was like two different worlds, totally different worlds. And um, that was something that A, knocked my confidence big time. And it really did knock my, um, you know, my sort of belief in what I was doing at that time in my life. What about personal, what about personal sacrifice, Ollie? Uh, in what respect? In terms of relations, relationships. I mean, that's to me, mate. I mean, I've only just got a grip on that in the last five years, six well, years. So, yeah, you know, sort of it happened very late to me as well. I didn't grow up until I got well past 40, mate. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Some people never grow up. <laughs> well, I think I have. But, you know, come on, do you want to talk about that? I mean, do you want to touch? Yeah, upon- yeah. No, I mean, 
listen, I was bouncing around relationship from, from relationship to relationship. Um, I think I say, I say it in my book, actually, it's quite a good interpretation of where I was. My relationships were like taking on, you know, sign up for a new lease car, you know, I'd hand one back in and then just take the other one out and that make sure there was some overlap. So there was never on my, never on my own. Well, you're not the first uh, person to have done that. Yeah. yeah so it was, that says a lot yeah. more about where you were than where they were. Yeah. Yeah, no, exactly, exactly, exactly. And I was, you know, I, I'm quite happy to confess, you know. I think as well, you know, the military lifestyle does appeal to a lot of females. You know, they th you know, there's a honeymoon period of thinking, yeah, that's cool. And, you know, but the reality of it is you're never around. And, um, you know. Particularly if you're SF, right? You're, yeah, on, you're no, exactly. on call 24. Yeah. You're on call 24-7, you know, so... You know, it's, it's not the best groundings for any type of relationship. And I know so many people that, you know, just at some point they've, you know, their relationship's fallen down. And a lot of the time is you need a woman that really does support you. And support doesn't mean that they're just there. Support means really supporting someone and, and helping them through those times and, and not, you know, trying to make sure that you're not coming home to arguments and all that kind of stuff and, and et cetera, et cetera. So it is a hard gig if you want to call it that for, for any female any partner of anyone that's in the special forces and any marriage that survives that is pretty special no one agrees because i know that the uh, the divorce rate is is, is quite high <laughs> from for friends but then leaving that's another shelf to fall off isn't it because yeah. you're you know there's the prestige you yeah. are the elite if you're walking around base everybody else is looking at you right everybody gets to know they might not know you but they know what you are or they perceive what you are and who you are. Um, you know, you're the astronauts. You're not the people that, pick, that, that put the petrol in a rocket. Right. Um, and then all of a sudden that's gone. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's a big shock to the system because you know, when you, when you're behind the wire, you know, you, you're living in this um, sort of, invincible world you feel invincible the people around you make you know a, a, a that sort of support network that really enforce that um and then it's, it's the same as you know we relate this to people that come out that premier league football players for instance you know gold medalists olympians that kind of thing you've come from this level of greatness for me at that time i thought well i can just i could just replicate this in any industry or any any walk of life when i leave and then as soon as you leave, there's a massive void. You know, the, the structure to your everyday has disappeared. The network of support, your colleagues, your mates has disappeared. And all of a sudden, you, and that's something you take for granted. You know, you really do take that for granted. And then when it disappears, you realize how strong that was, that bond was. And that's, that's hard. I wouldn't say, I, I, I was going to say it's hard to replace. I don't think you can replace it. Um, so then for me, I was sort of, bouncing around the world you know there's a lot less work you know when you're in the military you work hard play hard um and the play hard for me was the fact that i enjoyed a good few beers um when i was when i was uh, not working but then when i came out there was a lot less periods of uh, of working so then you know i'd, I'd always reach for a beer and that really started a, a downward spiral um together with everything else of this i think it's for me it's it's and, and again looking back it's about losing that sense of purpose. And unless you have something, a kind of structured pathway, as soon as you leave, you can't just cuff it. You know, you can't mm. just get some masking tape and wrap some tape around it and, and, and make it work. It just, you have to have some kind of structured plan to really get yourself some traction as soon as you come out. Because if you don't, you start to think, you start to question yourself. What, you know, I'm, I was a mini sub pilot for God's sake. I mean, I come outside and I'm thinking, what? <laughs> what can I do with that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and then you start to think about everything. You, you, it's hard for you if you, unless you've got something. It's hard for you to relate your world to the outside world and see where your true power is or true uh, skills are. Just to clear that up for people who don't know, when you say a mini sub, you're talking about being a frogman, an elite special forces yeah. frogman who uh, pilots a small submarine, parks it up next to other boats or ships or other submarines either gets out or does something that destroys that particular vehicle right yeah no absolutely That's a, that, there's not yeah. much call for that in the back of the yellow pages is there? <laughs> there's not mate i did think about there must be some kind of uh mini subs over in uh in in, in 
Vegas or somewhere. But, um, here's, here's one thing for you, else. You mentioned Vegas. There is. Oh, a Vegas. Vegas. What have I done there? I've opened up what? a can of worms. You have, you have, you have, you have, because um, you are not the only man that got married in Vegas. Uh, mate, you're looking at one as well. Oh, how, really? How well did that go for you? Uh, well, at the time, it, was, uh, it wasn't too bad, but that was short lived. Mine was a little longer lived, but yeah, they, they, marriages in Vegas don't last. I said, what stays in Vegas doesn't always stay in Vegas. No, no, that was, it was almost like I was doing this stuff. It was almost like a, a checklist that I had to do. You know, it had to be something I had to complete. Um, and yeah, that was, that was just, i tell you what, the, the one thing I, looking back again, you know, hindsight never won any wars, but it's great for reflection. And um, they train special forces operators to, to, to operate in chaos. You know, they find their flow when the chaos starts raining. And that's when they start to really do the job and feel, you know, very empowered. Um, and you can't just switch that off when you leave. So for me, you know, I was always searching for that level of chaos. You know, that's Again, an was... external influence looking outside of yourself to, 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 to solve something within you. Yeah, no, exactly. Always looking for this external fix that was going to be the answer, you know, be the solution. And it's not out there. But you ended up in Iraq. You went out on the circuit, right? Yeah, well, that's something I said I'd never do again. You know, it's like I, I got out and I thought I'm going to carve my own path, um, you know, get myself into, into business uh, and do something, you know, really, really create my own legacy. And then all of a sudden the, the, the statue came down, Ferdos Square, Saddam Hussein's statue. And, you know, after coming out of earning that next to nothing in the military, even in the special forces, you know, the opportunity to earn pretty much close to a year's wage in one month was something that I could not turn my nose up at, you know, so pretty much I ended up back over in Iraq and, um, you know, I spent the next five, six years over in Iraq in the war zone, which was probably the most traumatic time of my life. It's quite interesting, Ross, because... When I look at it, when I tell people that the safest I was, was when I was in the SBS. The bits yeah, on either it. side of that were the most horrendous. Well, and I think maybe to make clear of that, if you're special forces, you are sent in and tasked to eliminate and take out someone who doesn't know you're coming. When you're in Iraq on the circuit, you were there protecting something that is waiting for something to come. Is that it? Yeah. You got to the point of visualization, didn't you? Can you explain how that occurred in Iraq? Well, I've always been a bit of a dreamer, and I still am. And I, th I think it's a massive benefit to be a dreamer and really create, uh, you know, the outcome that you want, fall in love with the dream of that. And that's when I've looked back through all my career, that's what's got me to where I've wanted to be. When I joined the Marines, I was at 14 years old. I fell in love with the vision and the thought and the, the you know, this the concept of being a, a Royal Marine commando. And I used to sit and dream and dream about how that would feel, how it, how it would feel to me. Um, I really lived the moment like it had happened. I did the same with the Special Forces, exactly the same. It wasn't about the journey. You can't control that. And I feel also when you've got that kind of vision about the outcome that you want, you don't get bogged down on the journey. And if you don't have that bigger thing pulling you through, you become a victim of your circumstances when things go wrong. And sometimes that can stop you in your tracks. So for me, visualization was something I've always done, always will do. And now, and that incident in Iraq was, was something that really stamped that in stone, which told me this visualization stuff needs to be taken seriously. Explain that to me. Could you just explain to us what you mean by that, mate? In terms of the incident, go on. The incident, yeah. No, the incident was, that was, was basically, we were out there as contractors. We were paid an absolute fortune. Security work isn't, and it has to, isn't, um, it doesn't create revenue for a business. It's a cost. And as soon as they can downsize and get rid of the security detail, they'll do so. And really, because the statue came down, there was this perceived um, low level of threat, which was totally incorrect. And they were trying to downsize. They were bringing in the ABC bureau chief from New York, who I was working for at the time. And uh, I found out that his, one of his main jobs was to assess the need for security. So, I mean, I'd left everything to go over there and work, as we all had, um, and we were earning a bloody great wage. And the thought of that ending was just something I couldn't comprehend. You know, it's like, no way. After all this time, I earned, you know, and it's about to come to an end. So I was actually tasked with going to, going to fetch the ABC bureau chief, two of us actually, 
um, which was a stupid job to take on. You know, there was 12 people coming into Iraq and I said, how many of the team can I take? And he said, two, just you and one other. And you wouldn't do that in the military. It'd be the other way around. It'd be 12 people looking after two. You know what I mean? But you don't want to disrupt the dollar and you, you do stuff that, that, that compromises you. But anyway, and then all the way there, 14 hour road trip to, to Jordan to pick up the ABC bureau chief. And um, on the way there, I had a lot of time to think. And I was thinking to myself, how can I change the events of time? How can I, you know, you, you can't. And I just thought, what scenario would, would put this, this contract in stone? So basically I was sat there, you know, going through it in my head, go through all this, this actual scenario where it would, I get so much into the detail of it. And uh, so anyway, we got to the hotel that night. I'm sat there with my number two and I was like, you know what needs to happen tomorrow, don't you? And he's like, what? I made sure he had a beer. So he was sort of lubed up a bit. <laughs> Wrong you're over the, but you're over the border. You're in Jordan. You're in a hotel in Jordan, right? In a hotel in Jordan. Yeah, we're over the border. Safe. Uh, and I just said to him, this is what's going to happen tomorrow. And he said, what? I said, Said, we're going to get attacked and he just laughed at me he looked at me as if you, you're a lunatic i said no 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 he says if we get attacked tomorrow that's going to justify our existence we're going to that's going to seal the deal on the contract blah 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 and, and then we went through i got him, got him another beer and uh we, we went through every detail i said we're going to leave here go across the border we're going to be on our way to to baghdad we're going to get between ramadi and fallujah we're going to get ambushed um, and we went through every detail and we were like just laughing about it, you know, falling in love with what would happen. You know, the, we're going to get attacked. We could eat, we went into so much detail that we could smell the cordite from the bullets in the vehicle as we were shooting. Uh, and then I said, yeah, we're going to get out of it. The ABC bureau chief's going to see it happening. We're then going to get back to Baghdad. The doors are going to swing open. There's going to be a hero's welcome, you know, and then we're going to be tasting champagne. We are then going to, and then the contract will be signed, for, you know, and we'll, we'll secure the contract. Anyway, three o'clock in the morning, we woke up, forgot all about this sort of time at the bar and just got up, on with the job. And everything happened up until getting across the border, always a nightmare, so that was predictable anyway. Um, and then as we got to Fallujah, between Fallujah and Ramadi, um, I was driving, I nearly hit the steering wheel, I was that tired and I thought I need to spark up a conversation with, with my number two. I just said, mate, what we're going to do later is oh, we'll, we'll get back. We'll have a debrief. We'll go to the gym. Uh, you know, I'm tired, really tired. Um, and as I did that, I saw some flashing lights in the, uh, in the rear view mirror and uh, immediately caught my attention. I said, oh, hey, mate, there's something coming up from, from behind. And initially I was like hoping, I think it was a hope, really more than a thought that this was the, uh, the Americans or another security company. But as this vehicle got closer and closer and closer, we were probably doing about 120 Ks at that point in a four vehicle convoy, we're at the back. And um, next thing, this black Mercedes got closer and closer and closer. And then my dreams of it being anything hopeful uh, were quashed when all the windows came down. AK-47s came out from every window and, uh, and then rounds started going over the top of the vehicle. And I absolutely, I don't mind saying, I absolutely like I've never shit myself, even, even beat the monkey um i shit myself you know when you hear that automatic fire from six or four ak-47s it's like a crescendo from hell and um and i was i honestly was i was driving a vehicle i had an mp5 kurtz on my lap which is a little mini machine gun short one yeah yeah short one great for vehicle drills i i had the thumper in the back though so my number two had an ak-47 with um uh an ak in the back and um and next thing i thought as the bullets are going over the top, I thought, Jesus, we're going to have to do something. Otherwise, this is going to, you know, this is going to, they'll take the tires out, do something. It's going to go hor horribly wrong. So again, it was in that moment, this was like another break point. You know, it's that moment where I had to take action and I had to forget about the responsibility of the people in front of me, forget about all this stuff that we get consumed with that we can't control and really focus on one thing. And that was a threat. And in that moment, again, it wasn't, I just shouted, stand by in the car. And I shifted the car over to the central lane, center lane. So there's four lanes on the highway. We were hard against the central reservation heading towards Baghdad. I aggressively got the vehicle into the next lane, which then allowed the vehicle to close right up. I increased speed and boxed it in. They'd fallen for the trap. 
And uh, there was another vehicle coming up in the rear as well, their support vehicle. And it was at that moment, mate, I looked down to my left and I saw the Arab headdress. This, this guy was only a kid. I knew he was only a kid. And I didn't really want to do what I was going to have to do. And um, I could tell by his eyes, he was, he was nervous. He was scared. He, was, he didn't, probably didn't want to be there. But his AK-47 was coming onto my head, as was the one in the rear seat going onto my number two. And at that point, when we were there, it was, it was do or die. And it was, um, I gave the order to open fire. I popped up my AK-47, whacked it on my arm that was controlling the steering wheel and just blasted through the closed window into the, into the, into the Mercedes. Uh, and the guy in the, in the back with the AK-47 did the same. Um, the vehicle uh, sort of bounced off into the central reservation, smoke coming from the, the engine. And then we increased speed. It was about 140 Ks to Baghdad. And all the way, I mean, my ears were ringing like hell. I couldn't hear a thing. We give a contact report, told Baghdad we were on our way, no casualties. And I was just spun out, mate. I was absolutely spun out, not because of the shock of the attack, but just because everything was absolutely to the letter that I had visualized the night before. Everything, mate, the location, everything that happened, even smelling the cordite of the bullets in the vehicle as, as the rounds were going down. So then we get to Baghdad, as if it's not weird enough, but then the doors fling open on the compound. Heroes welcome. And I can remember opening the door, and it was a hot, still a hot evening. And I can remember hearing it, it was almost like change falling out your pocket onto the floor. And I looked down at the floor, and there's all the empty shell cases falling out of the vehicle, all the glass falling out. And as soon as I looked up, there was someone with a glass of champagne, thrust it into my hand exactly. And my number two is looking at me now as if I'm some kind of witch. Yeah. Um, you may be. <laughs> exactly. And I, I, got this, <laughs> I got the champagne. I could feel the bubbles going down my throat like I had done in, the vision, in my visualization. We were then called up to the ABC Bureau Chief's office where the two Bureau Chiefs were there. And when you do something like that action for, for a big organization like ABC, you, you know, it can, you have to justify your actions. It's not just about, you know, shooting everyone in the village and thinking you can get away with it. You know, so we didn't know what was going to happen up there, but we got up there and basically they congratulated us. Very shortly after that, after shaking our hands, they, they pushed the contract across, across the table where we signed it for another two years. I mean, and honestly, it just spun me out. I couldn't sleep that night. I was like thinking, oh my God, this stuff is crazy. It was like an epiphany for me. And you know, from that point really helped me to, um, to, to understand that this visualization stuff works. And even if people don't believe that, I feel they're missing out. And um, I certainly don't think any more about getting attacked. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> that, uh, that, well, let's just talk about this. I mean, uh, you know, you talked about these external factors pushing down on you. You know, you're living an extreme life. Yeah. What was the catalyst? I mean, you went to see a spiritual psychologist. I mean, that's not the average thing that someone in your line of work would consider doing. What made you do it? I don't know. Really, for me, it's, it's something that I, I see. I've seen a lot of people in my uh, line of work, my, my world, that have gone to doctors and, you know, they're looking for, you know, they're going, they've gone with problems. And all the doctor's done is sign a prescription and shove some drugs across the table. And before you know it, you know, I've had one particular close friend that, that committed suicide through that scenario. You know, I'm not a big believer in the solution to all our ailments being in a pill. So for me, going to a spiritual psychologist was avoidance of someone slipping something across the table and say, take, take two of them a day with a meal and you'll be all right. You know, I wasn't prepared to do that. And I understood as well. I've really been a big believer of what, you know, I don't, I, th I think people take for granted what is up here and that really that is the answer to everything. And, and, and really people don't understand the power of who we are. Um, and and everyone's too quick to reach for the, for the pills and the, you know, and I have, I've been subject to that in the past. So, you know, I've been addicted to Valium at one point and this was for me saying, I don't want to go down that sort of drug route of finding a solution. So, you know, one of the things that you talk about, um, in your books, um, I know, um, is, is, is the call to change. Yeah. Um, yeah. You talk me through that. Yeah, the call to change for me was really the point where I'd come out of the military, I'd been in Iraq, I left Iraq because it was 
causing my mental, uh, you know, my mental state was terrible. And then I tried to sort of get a normal kind of life. And then I got caught, uh, sort of something attracted my attention. I ended up over in Southeast Asia res rescuing kids from child prostitution and slavery. For the first time in my life, I can tell you that was the most, I hadn't found what I was looking for in the military. I suddenly found what I was looking for. And it's, that, it's called the Grey Man. Is that the organization? The Grey Man. Yeah, the Grey Man, the organization. So basically we go in and rescue kids that were being held and being sent into child prostitution and slavery. And although the thing got disbanded, and that's another story because it caused an international incident I had to escape out of Thailand and it ended, very, it ended overnight, um, I took something away from that which was amazing and that was the power of helping other people, which is so overwhelmingly uh, rewarding. Um, I wasn't there. I used all my money from Iraq to pay for the operation, so it wasn't financial gain. But seeing those kids going down the street in a school uniform with their bags after you know, their, their, their destiny was going to be sold into child prostitution and slavery was something I'll never forget. And really, that was the DNA to really start and focus on what I wanted to create. And that was create, creating my company, Breakpoint, helping other people. When I came back at that time, that was, that was when I hit rock bottom. And you hear people talking about this. You find your real direction. You, you know, you're like a phoenix from the ashes, but you have to hit rock bottom to find that point. And that for me was like, I started getting suicidal thoughts. I started, I was drinking heavily. I was just on this path of destruction. And I, I just went, I didn't know if I'd ever actually taken my life, but I do know that if you haven't any thoughts like that, it's already too late. You need, to, you need to do something about it. And for me at that time, I was like, you need to sort your life out. And really for me, it was the dream of being able to start something, finish what I'd started and helping other people. And that dream of Breakpoint is the one thing that's setting a goal in stone that took me away of being this victim took me away and had, I had something greater to focus on. And that's the one thing that pulled me out of that despair. Barriers to change, how to change. And then I think the hardest one of all, if I say Ollie, is sustaining change. How do you do that? How do you, once you've managed, you, you've broken, you've got to break your point, but how do you maintain it? People have, people don't understand. I mean, this is, this, you know, if I could relate this because people understand this, it's coming up to New Year's Eve soon. People will be asked, so what's your New Year's resolution, right? You know, people out there, first of all, they answer that question having not even thought about it. Second, they answer the question and, 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 and the answer is all about sounding impressive to the people that are, are around them. Two weeks into the new year, and before you know it, they've, they've thought, no, that's too difficult. And they've fallen back into the repeat habit loop of what is their life. They've, so what happens in this moment is the fact that you have to follow process when all this negativity strikes. And if you listen to your emotion and don't have a process to pull you through, you'll keep falling into that repeat habit loop, which offers you nothing at all. And that is really what it is. You have to follow a process. That's why the special forces are so good and the military are so good, because when all your world is falling apart, you follow a process. You're process driven to get from A to B to C to D, extract and get to safety. It's not about what you're thinking in your head. It's not about emotion in those really tough moments. It's about following process. And the more you can be process driven, the more you create those positive habits that really dilute the negative habits. Um, you know, you've got rid of those external factors, but as you say, you have to get to that breaking point to face what's inside you. And I think many of us, particularly now with the pandemic, are, are only beginning to realize the the effects that that is having on us mentally um what advice would you have to people listening about you know we may have we may have an antidote but we are going to suffer in other ways aren't we yeah no 100 percent. i think the more you know this is the kind of everything i recommend is something i recommend outside of covid and lockdown and everything else i think everyone needs to understand that we all need to invest in ourselves the most important project in life is you okay but your loved ones your job this that and the other are nowhere near as important as you and you need to start investing in yourself one thing we sort of refer to me and foxy refer to a lot is one meter square when all around you is falling apart, bring it back to your immediate environment and just focus on that, okay? Just focus on your immediate environment. The things you can't control, don't worry about. 
because it's, it's just causing you undue stress. Just focus on the things you can control. But really, I think a lot of people also need to be dynamic and adaptable because it's, it's the same as trauma. When people have some kind of traumatic event and also what's happened with our environment at the moment, people are fighting to get back to how it used to be. You're swimming upstream, okay? After a specific trauma, you're not that person anymore. So the more you fight to be something you're not anymore, the more frustration you're going to cause. So really, it's about being adaptable, being dynamic, start to set some goals in the future, regardless of the situation at the moment, because otherwise you're just going to get really bogged down and be a victim of your circumstances. You need something bigger pulling you through. So start, start setting those goals, whatever it is, job changes, re-educating yourself, relationships, anything it is, you need something bigger to pull you through. I know it's pretty brilliant advice, mate, I have to say. Um, Tell us about um, scar tissue, because I think you also, uh, you, you, when, you, when you're talking about how to, to help yourself mentally, you say, look, if you've got a scar there, you're going to have to lift the scab, get it out, yeah? And uh, this is your book, Scar Tissue, over there. Talk, talk us through it, mate. Yeah, scar tissue is really, um, when I first looked at fiction, I, I thought, look, I want to do self-development. That's really my focus, my, my drive. But when I really understood, I mean, storytelling is such a powerful platform such a powerful it's been used throughout the ages to, to pass on messages motivation all kinds of stuff and when i realized that i could underpin those messages in a fiction book um it was something that really appealed to me and i embraced um scar tissue is really although it's a fiction book it's very much the dna and heartbeat of my life after i left the special forces the emotional trauma i was going through while living in this very dangerous external world and um it really focuses on the main character which is alex abbott it really pinpoints the the, the journey he goes through the emotional trauma and also he's, he's called back into a world he'd, he'd prefer not to be in and um, he's, he's, he's sent back there to, well, not sent back, he's driven back there to, to go on a rescue mission, rescue mission for his son. Um, but really, you know, it's about those, these books for me, and I'm, I'm already writing um, uh, number two of my fiction. Um, I haven't got a name for it yet. But really, it's about being able to deliver those positive messages in a very exciting, very sort of edgy seat story and also pinpointing some very specific global issues that, that need highlighting. So like you, you're looking at all the things you do with Foxy, the 360, um, the call to change, and you're actually putting them into, into a story, which is, as you say, uh, is a method of passing on information that has been used before the ancient Greeks, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And, it, and the more, more chat, I mean, some people don't want to buy a self-development book, do they? No, no, know? of course not. But they can, when you can, you know, you can buy a fiction book that does pretty much the same thing. Um, and, and, and a very exciting story. I think that's very appealing. Ollie, can I just say a huge thank you? Um, it's been fascinating. Um, not only have you, you know, you had an exceptional uh, military career, uh, a very interesting uh, childhood, um, but also, mate, I think you said the most important thing to me is that you get now, it's about not looking at the external, it's looking at the internal, and then also you helping people. And, and the buzz that you get from that has totally changed you. Yeah, absolutely, mate. And I think a lot of people, especially in this world, everyone's fighting for the most social media followers. Even people in a close-knit team are fighting against each other. And we need, really need to understand the power of helping each other because that is so rewarding in itself. It's been great talking to you today and I really appreciate your time, mate. And we'll do this again. Please, let's do it again, Ollie. Pleasure, sir. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely.